closer. Oh, closer to the mic, okay. Wait, just take it out. Can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe I'll take it off. Hold out. Take it off, yeah. So I can move a little bit. Okay. There we go. Yay. Yay. All right. Okay, let me catch my breath. Had to, um, since you run over here because of all the uh, rain and the traffic, uh, we were over, over the French Quarter earlier. It's just like the traffic shut down. Um, so, uh, what I would like to uh, actually actually talk about are um, what I consider some of the uh, exciting developments in terms of, of research in uh, including body mind science. And what I'll talk about first is uh, mostly things that we're, we're learning uh, in terms of the uh, underlying biology and uh, what we call pathogenesis of, uh, of disease. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a lot of uh, you know, scientific concepts. So um, you know, I'm uh, more than happy to uh, explain it you know, later in more detail. But um, uh, certainly try not to get you know, bogged down into any of the you know, details in, in the first half. So uh, what I'm going to talk about first is going to be um, really, really basic science. And then uh, in, in the second half, uh, what I'll talk about are um, really new uh, you know, ways of thinking about treatment and clinical trials. So if, if the first half you're like, OK, this is not of interest to me at all, uh, uh, wait, and the second half will be more directly uh, applicable. Okay, but I thought I would at least first, uh, you know, uh, a lot of you are um, incredibly savvy and, and read the medical literature and, and know more about uh, IBM than your your doctor. So, so, so uh, for those of you that are uh, really interested in, in trying to understand what causes IBM, um, I want to spend about 20 minutes or so. Uh, sort of going over um, what we're learning. And the uh, initial uh, question which all of us have, of course, is uh, you know, what is IBM and what, and what causes IBM? And uh, unfortunately, after years and years of uh, research, we don't know the answer to that. However, um, we are learning um, that there are probably both genetic as well as uh, environmental or, or autoimmune triggers. And so uh, what, is, what is the new evidence for that? Well, uh, one, uh, a lot of you have probably heard uh, from uh, one of my colleagues, Chris Wild, Wash U, who, who's been doing a lot of genetics in, in IBM. And uh, we've known for a while that there are, are rare families with IBM. And so uh, we're starting to understand some of the uh, actual genes which, which may be uh, actually risk factors. Now, um, as, as most of you I'm sure know, the uh, risk of uh, actually passing you know, sporadic IBM down from one, one generation to the next is, uh, is almost zero. It's almost negligible. Uh, however, uh, we know that there are certainly genes in our, uh, uh, in our body that will uh, uh, you know, predispose one to developing IBM. And so, and so our hope is by understanding those uh, actual genetic components, it'll, it'll get us closer to a you know, real directly target for therapy. So um, one, one important thing that uh, we're working on is actually diagnosing this uh, earlier because uh, regardless of, of what treatment uh, we would have to offer, um, the earlier we can start the treatment, the uh, uh, more likely it is to uh, have a, uh, a beneficial effect. And, um, uh, and finally, uh, what I'm going to talk about are what, what are referred to as uh, actually biomarkers. And uh, 
biomarkers are what are really uh, needed in terms of clinical trials and advancing new therapies for uh, IBM. So, um, okay. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about the uh, underlying debate between the uh, cause of IBM. So, uh, most of you are probably aware of this uh, controversy. Is it autoimmune? Is it more of a, a, a degenerative disease? Uh, a lot of people think of it as uh, almost a Alzheimer's disease of the muscle, right? Uh, many of you probably heard of that. So, so uh, basically what I've listed here are um, the main arguments in favor of either the autoimmune hypothesis or the uh, primary degenerative hypothesis. And what, uh, what I would say is that there's actually pretty good evidence that uh, actually both are involved. And so uh, I think more and more pe uh, people are, 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 are beginning to think that there's probably an autoimmune uh, <coughs> event or trigger, if you will, that in the uh, in an individual who is uh, you know, susceptible based on, on genetics and uh, uh, you know, possibly environmental exposures, uh, aging process, that the uh, autoimmune response uh, actually triggers uh, something in the muscle, which uh, once that starts, the only way to uh, actually slow it down or stop it is to uh, actually, actually prevent what is, is causing the muscle itself to uh, actually break down. And so, uh, uh, in other words, uh, once the IBM is initiated, we think that the uh, immune system is, is really not playing an important role in terms of, of driving the uh, actual muscle degeneration. Now, uh, what I've just said is uh, extremely controversial. There are other IBM experts who, uh, you, know, you know, still believe that it's it's really the uh, you know T cells that are are actually the primary cause that are actually invading the muscle and, and causing it to break down. Um, and so, uh, really, what we need are better ways of, of answering this question of whether uh, it's an autoimmune. Uh, muscle disease that is uh, is driving disease progression, or is it actually something inherent in the muscle? And so, um, uh, what I've listed here are uh, what I would consider two uh, exciting experiments uh, and developments that are um, uh, in the works. Um, one, uh, many of you might, uh, might have heard of, are uh, new. Uh, monoclonal antibodies being developed uh, actually at uh, Harvard by, uh, by Dr. Greenberg, um, in which he is, uh, is trying to actually selectively remove the uh, harmful T cells, those uh, actual CD8 T cells that are invading the muscle. So, so the uh, immunosuppressive uh, you know, drugs that we tried for years that uh, we don't think work uh, really do not do a good job at, at getting rid of those those harmful T cells. And so, uh, if um, so, uh, all of us are, are <coughs> optimistic that if we can, you know, really get rid of these T cells uh, using new methods, that uh, maybe that will will help. Um, another. Uh, approach that uh, we're taking at, at Johns Hopkins to uh, really try and answer this question is, uh, is basically um, removing uh, muscle from an IBM patient from a, a, a circulating immune system. And uh, we can do that uh, using what's called a xenograft model. And so uh, 
the way that it works is uh, we take muscle biopsy um, uh, and actually implant it uh, into the leg of a mouse. The uh, muscle will, uh, so the uh, muscle fibers uh, initially degenerate um, and then they have to uh, regenerate using the uh, mouse circulatory system. And so, so, so the mouse actually uh, reiterates the muscle, it revascularizes the muscle. And in, uh, uh, in normal individuals, um, the muscle will, uh, will grow back perfectly normal. And, and we can see a human muscle uh, living within a mouse. What's important about this experiment is the uh, mouse is engineered to uh, actually lack any, any immune cells. And so uh, we think that if we can uh, remove the uh, immune system and then see what happens to this muscle, uh, we can hopefully uh, answer this question. And if it works, um, we might even be able to use uh, one's individual muscle biopsy to uh, actually do uh, you know, clinical trials in a mouse and see uh, how well the muscle uh, in a mouse model responds to uh, uh, various drugs. So, the, so um, what I can tell you, so it's, it's very early, but um, what I can tell you is that uh, in, the, uh, in the xenograft experiments that we've done so far from IDM, there uh, appears to be a problem with, uh, with the muscle uh, muscle cells actually uh, regenerating, but um, but in the mouse host, uh, once they regenerate, we can actually see uh, some signs of uh, inclusions. So uh, what we call p62 aggregates, uh, upregulation of, of MHC1. Um, now that's uh, uh, it's extremely early, but. If, if this turns out to be true, this would suggest that the uh, idea muscle is, is really uh, inherently the problem rather than the uh, immune cells. So uh, we still have a lot of work to do, but um, it's, uh, uh, it's promising at this point. Okay, so um, in terms of, uh, of what's happening inside the muscle that is causing uh, idea and tissue to uh, actually degenerate, a lot of, uh, a lot of proteins uh, have been implicated. So this is, is a list of, of 80 uh, as, uh, uh, as of 2009, and so now it's probably uh, 150. Um, and uh, uh, until recently, the way uh, researchers um, you know, tried to figure out what, what's happening inside muscle is, is uh, having a, an individual hypothesis saying, well, I wonder if, uh, if protein X is altered in inclusion body myositis. So uh, why don't I look at this protein in muscle tissue? Uh, over the last uh, you know, five or six years, um, a number of, of labs around the country have developed uh, very high throughput uh, unbiased ways of, of analyzing uh, muscle tissue. So, so things we call, we call proteomics uh, and mass spec. And uh, what this allows us is really a uh, unbiased way of looking at uh, all of the cells in a muscle tissue, all of the uh, uh, different RNA transcripts, the uh, mRNAs that make up uh, individual proteins, um, as well as the individual proteins themselves. So uh, I predict that in the next several years, we'll have a, a much better understanding of uh, what is exactly in these inclusions that is toxic. And uh, I have another, uh, yeah, so, I'll, so uh, as of 2014, this was, uh, this was one model for the uh, underlying cause of, of IBM. 
and if it doesn't make sense to you, uh, it, uh, it certainly doesn't make sense to me either. <laughs> uh, it's basically just saying there's, there's aging, there's predisposing genes, something in the environment, virus, toxin, causes auto, uh, auto uh, immunity inflammation, and then a whole bunch of arrows. And so it's, it, it's one idea of what's, uh, of what's maybe happening. But um, so uh, this is this is where we're at, based on you know uh, individual hypotheses and testing proteins one at a time. Um, now, uh, now that we have whole genome level and whole proteome level uh, analyses, uh, we'll have a much better picture of what's happening in the muscle and IPM. Um, and uh, uh, a number of labs, including ours, are uh, are are doing uh, what's called mass spec, um, and that is uh, is basically taking all all the muscle proteins and identifying uh, each and every one and how it's altered in IBM uh, muscle. So the uh, goal here really is to you know, try to figure out. Uh, what's causing these uh, inclusions, uh, which we think are the uh, underlying cause of, of muscle degeneration. All right, so back to what I was saying about the um, you know, real challenge right now and, and what's really needed in terms of uh, IBM clinical trials is development of a biological marker or biomarker. So, uh, a biomarker is defined as a characteristic that is uh, objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of uh, normal biological process, pathogenic process, in this case IBM, or a, or a pharmacological response to a therapeutic intervention. So uh, in other words, um, we need a way to measure uh, objectively how any treatment is uh, actually altering the uh, muscle cell physiology. Um, uh, most of you know that the you know, blood test that we currently have, for example, CPK or CK, is, is not a reliable biomarker for muscle disease activity, right? So uh, uh, um, once, if, 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 if a CK uh, you know, goes up, that may actually be uh, a sign that um, you're exercising more and your uh, muscles are, uh, are are getting bigger. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and and, uh, uh, and uh, on the flip side, if the, uh, if your CK is going down, it may actually mean that your uh, muscle is getting smaller. So uh, really, really, CK is not. Yeah, not a good biomarker. Uh, what we need is a biomarker that will tell us something about how the uh, underlying disease is changing. So uh, that's what I'm gonna uh, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about. And and the reason why it's so important is uh, uh, in, in diseases which are slowly progressive, like IBM. If, uh, if one simply uses clinical endpoints, so that is, uh, uh, you know, a patient report outcome, so how you're feeling or our measurement of your muscle function, um, it, it, it will take uh, uh, at a minimum of, of a year, probably two or three years, uh, before we can really see a, a clear effect. Whereas if we have a biomarker, uh, it can serve really as, as a surrogate endpoint, um, meaning a uh, way to uh, determine whether or not our therapeutic intervention is having the uh, desired effect on, on the underlying disease process in IBM. So, so that is, is, is what's critically needed. Um, and uh, one other thing we need to learn more about is the uh, natural history and the variability of IBM. Um, uh, many of you probably know that there uh, is uh, a huge uh, uh, 
range of severity and um, rates of, of uh, actual progression of, of IBM such that uh, here's an example of a study where they quantitatively uh, measured muscle strength and over, uh, over a six month period, uh, while most patients uh, worsened slightly, there were uh, a number of patients who uh, actually improved or stabilized. And so uh, if we had a way to uh, actually predict which patients would be getting uh, worse faster or, or slower, it would greatly accelerate our, our power of clinical trials. And, uh, more, and recently, we've, uh, we've been, uh, the uh, IBM research community has uh, identified some. Um, one is the uh, uh, antibody, uh, NT5C1A. Um, most of you, I'm sure, are uh, uh, aware of it you know, being, uh, in some cases, useful in terms of making a diagnosis. What, uh, uh, what we're starting to, to see is that it um, might actually also be valuable in terms of uh, determining rate of, uh, of, of severity, uh, rate of progression of disease. Um, this is a, a, a recent study published at UC Ir uh, Irvine um, where they showed that uh, actually, patients who were um, antibody positive um, had uh, more severe um, motor uh, and, uh, and respiratory uh, symptoms in addition to uh, more problems swallowing. And so, um, uh, what this means is that um, we can likely use the antibody status to uh, determine whether uh, uh, someone's, someone's disease is, is more likely to be uh, rapidly progressive or, or slowly progressive. And uh, perhaps we can actually use the uh, antibody titer as a measure of uh, response to a, a therapy. So uh, we don't know the answer to that yet, but uh, research is, is ongoing to see whether the uh, anti-NT5C1A antibody may actually be useful in terms of serving uh, as a, uh, a surrogate endpoint or biomarker. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a nice review by uh, one of our, our board members, Steve Greenberg, um, on, on biomarkers of uh, inclusion body myositis that uh, I'm pretty sure is uh, uh, actually freely accessible on the web, in current opinion, uh, which I think is a nice uh, nice paper. Um, actually, Steve recently published a very uh, intriguing study that I think uh, many of you are uh, uh, aware of, showing that if he looks at uh, lymphocytes in the blood, um, patients with, with IBM uh, are more likely to have uh, abnormal CD8 T cells. And so uh, uh, because of this finding, um, his main focus right now is in trying to uh, find ways of getting rid of these abnormal CD8 T cells, uh, which are present in as, as many as 40 to 50 percent of, of patients with sporadic IBM. So it's uh, uh, a very um, uh, intriguing finding. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch gears, um, and I'm going to try to uh, make this as uh, you know, simple as I possibly can. But uh, this is what what my lab is working on, and uh, I think it, uh, I think it's a very uh, exciting um, uh, area because it it links uh, what we know about. Uh, ALS and frontal temporal dementia, uh, the uh, degenerative disease of neurons, with uh, with some of the similarities uh, of what we're seeing in muscle biopsy in inclusion body myositis. So uh, this is getting back to the idea that there is first an autoimmune trigger that then 
initiates a, a degenerative cascade. And that's uh, really what we think happens in, in ALS and frontotemporal dementia as well. Although there's, there's little evidence that it's an, an autoimmune uh, uh, actual trigger, but uh, most people think that you know, there's some, some sort of environmental trigger in ALS as well. So, um, in order to uh, 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 explain how this uh, works, I'm going to have to take you through uh, a little bit of, uh, of cellular and molecular biology. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be uh, uh, as basic and go through it as quickly as I can. So, um, it's been known now for uh, over 10 years that that the central uh, 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 pathologic problem in ALS and, and frontotemporal dementia is abnormal localization of a protein known, uh, uh, written up there, TAR DNA binding protein 43, TDB43. And uh, it's become clear, uh, because of a lot of research in ALS, that uh, what happens is the uh, protein is normally um, localized in the nucleus, and uh, in, in ALS uh, motor neurons, it uh, moves out uh, into the cytoplasm. So it's lost from the nucleus, and it forms these aggregates in the cytoplasm. And uh, for a number of years, people have, have, deba have uh, really debated, well, is the problem that you don't have TDB43 in the nucleus, or is the problem that you're you're having too many of, of these aggregates or inclusions of TDB43 uh, in the cytoplasm? So here's a uh, really nice picture uh, that I think it, that I think uh, really shows what is clearly happening in ALS. So um, in blue here is. Uh, a nucleus which has uh, lost its uh, localization of TDP43, uh, which is stained here in brown. Okay, so uh, this this motor neuron, which you can just barely make out the uh, edges of the um, uh, plasma cell membrane, uh, has this this huge blob of TDP43, which is probably bad, and has lost. TDP43 from the nucleus, uh, which is also uh, probably bad. So, so here's uh, a normal, what, what a normal neuron should look like, and you can see it uh, here. And then here's the uh, neuron of uh, an ALS patient. So it's lost TDP43 from the nucleus, and it uh, has a big blob of it in the cytoplasm. Uh, about uh, six years ago now, actually Steve Greenberg, who um, uh, many of you know is, has really been a leader in the field of IBM, uh, his lab showed that very similar changes are seen in muscle of uh, inclusion body myocytes. So, so again, this protein is lost from the nucleus and uh, forms aggregates in the cytoplasm. And in fact, if uh, when he compared uh, what he saw with changes in TDP43 with all the other uh, sort of classic pathological abnormalities, which many of you have read about on your muscle biopsy report, such as ring vacuoles, uh, amyloid, hunger red, the uh, percentage of fibers with these ab uh, uh, abnormal localization of TDP43 is much, much higher than uh, any of the other changes. And, uh, and furthermore, it's actually, uh, it could be used uh, actually diagnostically. So it has uh, very high sensitivity and specificity for, uh, for diagnosing IBM. Uh, <clears throat> subsequently, in the, last, uh, in the last five or six years, a number of groups have uh, repeated these observations that, um, and it's not only true for TDP43, but other related proteins. So it definitely seems to be a, a common uh, mechanism. 
I'll uh, skip over this. Okay, so uh, as in uh, ALS, really, really the key question then is, uh, is this mislocalization of, of TDP43 really, really, con really contributing to uh, IBM muscle degeneration? And so one way that we can answer that in a mouse model is by removing the actual TDP43 gene selectively from uh, muscles. And so um, uh, in collaboration with one of my colleagues, Phil Wong at Johns Hopkins, who uh, developed a, uh, a mouse tool to be able to uh, perform that experiment, we, uh, we selectively <coughs> removed uh, TDP43 from the muscle. So what you can see here is that it's, it's reduced in the muscle uh, relative to control. Uh, whereas it's nor at, at normal levels in the heart and brain. The, um, uh, the mice actually um, uh, are, are born normally, develop normally, but then um, around, uh, around three months of age, uh, begin to lose weight, their uh, muscles shrink, and, and eventually they die. So uh, these experiments clearly show that this protein uh, is in fact essential for uh, muscle maintenance. So uh, we next asked um, whether we saw any of the changes that uh, are commonly seen in IBM patient muscle. And in fact, uh, we see uh, many of the uh, underlying changes, including uh, atrophy, so smaller cells in uh, TDP43 knockout uh, mice, whoops, um, as well as, uh, as rim vacuoles, and, uh, and uh, abnormal mitochondria. So uh, all, of, all of these things uh, uh, told us that it's possible that loss of TDP43 from the uh, muscle is actually uh, contributing to the uh, degeneration of muscle uh, in IBM. Um, and then finally, looking at some of the more specific markers like P62 and ubiquitin that label the inclusions in IBM uh, and, and also doing electron microscopy, uh, we can see the uh, pathological hallmark of IBM. So the inclusions uh, are present in these plants. So, um, so what this suggests is that, uh, you know, perhaps the loss of TDP43 from muscle, uh, as is the case in uh, neurons in ALS and frontal temporal dementia, uh, perhaps the loss of this critical protein in muscle is, is actually contributing to uh, muscle degeneration in IBM. Okay, so what is, uh, what is this protein doing? So, um, okay, so now, now this part's really gonna get technical. So, and I apologize, but it's, it's three slides. But the uh, bottom line is, is uh, so uh, all of you know that uh, you have genes that are, uh, uh, that become um, transcribed into RNA, and then that RNA becomes translated into a protein, okay? And uh, this, is, this is basically what is demonstrated here. So, uh, genes have introns and exons. So introns are the gaps in between the uh, exons, which uh, are not actually coding for amino acids that are making up a protein. Okay. And so, so what what TDP43 does is when when you're going from RNA to protein, you have to first do what's called uh, what's called splice the RNA. So TDP43 is involved in RNA splicing. And normally it, it sits uh, on the RNA and prevents incorporation of, of what are called uh, what are called cryptic exons. And uh, and Phil Wong, my collaborator at Johns Hopkins, uh, published a paper in Science last year showing that the critical function of TDP43, uh, which causes ALS and frontotemporal dementia, um, is that 
when TDP43 is lost from the nucleus, uh, it no longer is able to uh, prevent incorporation of this cryptic exon into the uh, translated protein. And so instead of having, uh, instead of being able to spell P-R-T-E-I-N, now you have P-R-O with, uh, with an X. So, so there's been a mistake in uh, actually translating this protein. Okay. And uh, I'm not going to go over his, uh, his very nice paper, but he, he, uh, he showed it very conclusively in, uh, in ALS and FTD. So then we next asked, uh, given that uh, we think loss of TDP43 is maybe playing a role, uh, whether uh, we see similar changes in uh, IBM uh, muscle. And uh, in fact, using a very similar approach, looking at uh, IBM muscle biopsies, uh, we can uh, very clearly see in every uh, IBM case that we've looked at thus far, <clears throat> the presence of these, of these cryptic exons. And we don't ever see it in control or other forms of myositis. So uh, what does that mean? So uh, what we think is that when you have a cryptic exon, you are uh, altering a large number of critical proteins that are needed for uh, normal health of the muscle cell. So uh, in terms of, uh, of therapy, uh, one might ask, okay, can we uh, deliver this function back? Well, uh, we know too much, uh, too much TDP43 is, is toxic, so, so we couldn't just inject that or or you know, have a pill uh, for TDP43. But um, there is, so I'm going to skip that, there is uh, actually a way to replace uh, TDP43's uh, function um, using another uh, related protein called Raver1, which has the splicing repressor domain. And, uh, uh, and Basically, what he's shown in cells from uh, uh, ALS is that he can, he can fully rescue the uh, uh, defect in ALS. Uh, so here's, uh, here's an example here. So uh, if, if this is the normal gene expression uh, here on the control, um, on top here, the TB43 knockout is what it looks like uh, when you don't have TB43, so all the all the blue genes are markedly downregulated. All the red ones are upregulated. So you can see the uh, overall genetic profile is is markedly alterated. But then when uh, when he gets this rescue construct, uh, it looks uh, much more normal. And uh, this this treatment strategy is actually um, in development now uh, at Johns Hopkins for. Uh, ALS and frontal temporal dementia, and the uh, and if it's true that the same underlying you know, biochemical problem is happening in muscle, uh, there's no reason that uh, we can't use the same uh, construct and deliver it uh, actually directly into muscle cells. So it's uh, it's very early days, but uh, we think it's, uh, uh, it's it's very exciting. So. Um, let me back up here and, and, uh, uh, and just sort of summarize um, what uh, what we're thinking is basically happening uh, inside muscle cells to cause IBM. Uh, and then I promise you that this is my last slide where I'm going to talk about a lot of proteins and stuff, and then we're going to get to therapy. So uh, we think that there is loss of this critical protein TDP43 from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it's toxic. And it, it forms inclusions. And because of the misplacing, there are a number of genetic defects that are leading to uh, uh, toxic changes in, in the muscle, such as uh, damaged mitochondria, and a problem with uh, what's called autophagy, which is basically the cellular process of getting rid of inclusions, of, of throwing them away in the trash can. And uh, uh, because of this, 
this is what's causing the rim vacuoles, and this is what's causing the uh, inclusions in muscle. And so our hypothesis is that, uh, that this is what is really, really driving degeneration in muscle at IBM. And um, uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about uh, some new clinical trials that are, are actually targeting uh, these pathways. Um, one of which uh, you've probably heard of, uh, aramacobol is uh, designed to help uh, prevent the inclusion from forming in the first place. Um, and rapamycin, <coughs> uh, a clinical trial uh, occurring in France, is basically designed to help improve uh, autophagy and getting rid of the inclusions once they form. And I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, what I was talking about, uh, the challenge of, of biomarker development. So, so we're um, uh, really trying to uh, pursue, uh, you know, testing of uh, first of all this mouse model uh, where TDB43 is, is lacking in, in the muscle to see if indeed it, uh, it is a good model for, for setting sporadic IBM, and uh, we're trying to develop better ways of detecting uh, these these cryptic exons. So, so we can uh, detect it very easily from a muscle biopsy, but, uh, but boy, if we could detect it uh, on a blood test, and if that indeed told us uh, how severe the muscle degeneration is, uh, that would be an extremely useful biomarker. So, so we're in the process of, of trying to develop uh, cryptic exon detection uh, uh, methods and then seeing if the presence of them uh, actually correlates with uh, disease activity and, and therefore being used as a biomarker. Um, and, uh, and finally, I mentioned, uh, at least theoretically, uh, we should be able to uh, actually correct this uh, abnormal splicing defect in generation of cryptic exons. So um, why don't I why don't I take a little break there, uh, answer uh, any any questions about that part, um, and then what I'm going to talk about um, in the uh, remaining you know, 30 minutes or so is um, uh, are are mostly things that you you've heard about in terms of of uh, improving treatments for. Uh, IBM, for example, you know, improving hand weakness, improving swallowing function, uh, improving leg weakness. So, um, any any questions about uh, what I've what I've been talking about in terms of biomarker and TDP forty three? Right. So. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So uh, uh, basically, his question is uh, whether uh, whether whether this hypothesis, our TDP forty three hypothesis, is um, does that uh, exclude an autoimmune or a, a, a genetic cause? Um, and uh, uh, the answer is no. So um, uh, it. Would it, um, it, it would be very consistent with the idea that there are, are both uh, genetic and environmental uh, factors. So, so it's it's clear that this uh, process is, is what drives uh, motor neuron degeneration in, in ALS. Um, and so, uh, and uh, in that case, there are, are also genetic and environmental factors, and it's also increased association with aging. Um, and uh, so in inclusion body myositis, um, if the same thing is, is happening in the muscle, uh, it could easily be triggered by some environmental exposure or an autoimmune uh, response. No, so, yeah, right, so it's, uh, uh, it's much more related, we think, to uh, 
in front of triple dementia. Uh, some of you might have heard of uh, what's called BCP. It's uh, one of the more common inherited forms of inclusion body myositis, uh, also known as IBN PFD, inclusion body my uh, myopathy with Hedges disease and frontal temporal dementia. So, um, uh, one of the reasons why, why we really started working on this pathway is because it, it's very clear that uh, mutations in this BCP protein, uh, which clearly interacts with TDD43, um, uh, mutations in some family members uh, actually causes IBM, in others it can cause ALS, in others it can cause uh, uh, actual frontal temporal dementia. So it's, uh, it's extremely rare. It's a rare autosomal dominant uh, hereditary uh, IBM. And as is the case in most inherited IBMs, there is, is not inflammation. So, it's, so, so there's an ongoing question as to really how well these hereditary uh, forms of uh, IBM, uh, how well what we learn in those diseases is able to translate to the much more common sporadic uh, idea. So if you did generate uh, the muscle with uh, muscle stem cells, uh, you would get the same genetic background. It's not to say that the environment doesn't. You expect that new muscle that to be uh, more healthier than the old muscle. Could you um, repeat the question? Yeah, the uh, question is whether if one were to be able to replace damaged muscle with uh, muscle cells derived from uh, actually stem cells, uh, whether it's uh, one's own stem cells or, or from a donor, whether uh, one would predict the same uh, actual, actual pathological uh, consequences. So the um, answer to that is, is very complex. There is a theory in, in degenerative diseases that there is, uh, is actually spread of uh, a, almost like a prion-like process, so it, it can actually spread from one cell to the next, so no one's ever shown that in IBM, but there's good evidence that it happens in, in Alzheimer's disease, ALS, frontal dementia, other degenerative disease, diseases, so it's certainly possible that even if, uh, even if one were to be able to uh, Place um, injured muscle cells with uh, normal stem cells. That uh, whatever is causing IBM uh, might also uh, affect those stem cells as well. Yes. Yes. Um, if you can get this to work and you get the conclusions to go away, can the person or the patient? then build their muscle back up if their muscle becomes, becomes a, a, even if it's small and healthy? Yeah, uh, the, um, the question there is if, um, if one can stop the underlying process that is causing muscles to uh, actually degenerate, are the muscles able to uh, regenerate and build themselves back up? Uh, the answer really is in uh, how severe the uh, uh, muscle damage is. So, if um, when there is is almost a, you know a complete fatty replacement, uh, uh, then there's really not a uh, a a supportive environment for muscle cells to uh, regenerate and regrow. Um, Whereas in a uh, muscle that is, uh, is small, uh, atrophied, but functional, then, then absolutely. Okay. Uh, exercise and um, you know, things like that can certainly you know, rebuild in your muscle. Um, I have two questions, and it's really a clarification. One, Dr. Greenberg's uh, blood test. Yes. That identifies what in the blood. Yeah, so uh, it is a, um, an antibody, an autoantibody, uh, anti-NT5C1A. Um, and uh, we don't really know 
what the relationship is between this antibody and the muscle degeneration itself. So uh, research is, is ongoing to try to figure out what, if any, the relationship is. So, so we don't know yet uh, whether you know if you have a lot of that uh, a lot of that antibody that um, you're you're going to have a, a more faster uh, disease uh, versus if you don't have the antibody at all. Uh, I mean, clearly, the uh, antibody isn't necessary, and in uh, over a third of of IBM patients, we can't. Uh, we can't find any uh, evidence of this antibody. So it's possible that it's just a, a bystander. So it's developed uh, uh, in response to the muscle degeneration. Right, but I mean, you're saying that they're looking at that as an area of research. I mean, That's right. My reading has been at some point, taking blood is going to be the way they're going to diagnose a lot of things. I don't know if that's I prefer that's that's looking at individual blood. So Yeah, right. So so if, so if the um, antibody is uh, uh, in, fact, uh, in fact positive, it is um, it's not hundred percent that it's IBM, but it is uh, you know suggestive of, of a diagnosis of IBM. Whereas if it's negative, it uh, it's really not helpful. It does not exclude a diagnosis. Right. In the same way people have biopsies that don't show IBM because that's not always a hundred percent. Right. So. Correct. Um, what I would say though about uh, muscle biopsies is uh, we're getting better now at using things like uh, MRI to uh, uh, actually you know, determine which muscle to biopsy. And, uh, and as, I, as I was showing you, uh, we have uh, newer stains, so P62, TDP43. Uh, we have more sensitive markers for uh, identifying IBM. So if, you're, uh, if one's muscle biopsy is, uh, is done at a specialized center like you know, Johns Hopkins, WashU, Harvard, et cetera, uh, then the uh, you know, likelihood of, of making the correct diagnosis is, is, is very high. All right, so um, let me switch gears now, and uh, we'll talk about um, uh, various treatments for, for IBM. So um, many of you have uh, likely tried, you know, prednisone, IBIG, methotrexate, some immunosuppressive uh, medication at some point, um, and uh, probably all of you, but have uh, you know, really been told that uh, it doesn't work in IBM. And it's, uh, but uh, what I would say is even though we've done clinical trials for a number of immunosuppressive uh, agents, the way those trials have been run is looking at uh, uh, a large number of patients at all different stages of, of, of their disease. and. Uh, we still, we still don't know if something like even prednisone or, or cytoxane or some other uh, really potent uh, immunosuppressive uh, medication, if given early enough, might have a dramatic effect in slowing uh, the uh, actual disease progression. Um, and so uh, one thing that a number of us uh, have been talking about is in, in selected patients who uh, have uh, uh, only inflammation and not a lot of degeneration and fatty replacement, if we if we start immunosuppressive uh, uh, medications very early, uh, might that have an effect? So that's something that we're uh, interested in uh, in looking at. And so here's a uh, uh, actually a case of, uh, of one of my patients who um, uh, developed 18 months of, uh, of gradually progressive uh, weakness that started with, uh, with left foot drop, uh, gradually progressing to uh, uh, weakness in her upper legs and problem swallowing. She had uh, an exam, uh, EMG and muscle biopsy, which were uh, typical for IBM, 
what was very uh, atypical in her is that in the, gosh, I'm sorry, in the um, MRI, uh, we saw almost no atrophy or fatty replacement, which is extremely unusual and really suggests that her uh, uh, IBM was very early. But um, whereas if we looked at another uh, uh, imaging sequence, what we call STIR, that can uh, actually see inflammation, uh, you can see how bright the muscle is. So it's very abnormal. And so uh, we decided, uh, uh, because of this, after discussing you know, the risks and side effects of, of different uh, immunosuppressive medications, she uh, really wanted to try something. Uh, we started her uh, on prednisone, uh, uh, actually 60 milligrams, and um, within a few months, she had, had uh, an, a, a very obvious improvement in muscle strength, so both uh, subjectively as well as objectively. Uh, she, she developed a lot of side effects from prednisone, so we switched her to uh, IVIG. And uh, so, so uh, the last thing I have on here is in 2014, but um, when I last saw her a few months ago, uh, uh, what, what we found is that her knee extension and hip flexion, so her proximal leg weakness, really in the last uh, almost four years now has uh, really not changed at all. However, her hand weakness has, uh, has gradually worsened. And that, um, uh, we're actually seeing that quite a bit, is that in, in some patients that seem to have an aggressive overlap of uh, what seems like you know, PM and IBM, that uh, we can treat them you know, very aggressively and, and get some improvement in their proximal weakness, like their upper leg weakness, but uh, uh, essentially never, uh, never get improvement in the, um, uh, in the hands or, or distal legs. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, any of you uh, early on did notice an improvement with uh, uh, immunosuppressive medications, but uh, many of our patients will uh, you know, tell us that um, early on, I, I uh, noticed a definite improvement uh, with uh, prednisone or IVIG, but then uh, over time, it gradually got worse. So uh, I think it's, it's at least worth considering that IBM is, is not just one disease, uh, it's a you know, you know, heterogeneous disease with, with probably multiple different uh, triggers, and that uh, in some cases, if we can treat uh, early enough before there's been a lot of uh, a fatty replacement of the muscle, uh, we can perhaps uh, actually slow the uh, underlying disease process down. So that's one thing that we're um, interested in looking at more carefully. All right, so the uh, mainstay, though, of uh, management of occlusion body myositis uh, is, uh, is actually what's listed here um, on this slide. And um, uh, hopefully, um, all of you have had, had a chance to uh, attend one of the sessions at the meeting on, on exercise. IBM. So um, really, it's just in the last you know five years or ten years that uh, my study specialists have really begun to appreciate how how beneficial uh, exercise is in inclusion body myositis, and I'll uh, you know, talk about that a little bit more. Uh, in terms of uh, orthopedic and uh, orthotic devices. Uh, for sure, for um, uh, individuals with a foot drop, and, and ankle foot orthosis is, uh, is beneficial. Um, uh, a newer device known as uh, a stance control orthosis, uh, which I have uh, uh, picture pictured here. Um, most patients in whom I've tried this, uh, even though um, you would think that it would it would help stabilize the knee and prevent falls from your uh, you know, knee just giving way. Um, what most patients uh, notice is that 
because uh, because it's it, it's so bulky, uh, even though it's made of very lightweight material, that it actually makes makes it more difficult for them to move. Uh, uh, especially if there's any weakness in the uh, upper leg. Um, have uh, any of you had uh, benefited from uh, one of these SCO stance control uh, orthosis? I'm, uh, I'm looking to find somebody who, who loves this brace. <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Um, okay, so the other uh, uh, actual treatments uh, so anabolic steroids, uh, dysphagia, and clinical trials are, are, are what I'll talk about in the next, uh, in the remaining 30 minutes. So uh, exercise, um, really I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, we've seen patients that are incredibly motivated that will exercise uh, actually three hours a day, an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half in the evening, every day. Um, and. Uh, we're actually seeing uh, some of these patients getting stronger. So the, uh, I mean, when I first started seeing patients with IBM, what I what I hope for is is patients, uh, if they exercise, it would it would, it would slow progression of disease. But in fact, um, exercise actually you know makes the uh, uh, remaining muscles, the healthy muscles, stronger, and they're able to compensate for the uh, injured muscles. Um, there, there is uh, actually a really nice paper uh, published here that uh, really talks about um, one particular uh, exercise program that's been studied in IBM. Uh, but, but really the key is that um, exercise is done uh, regularly, so uh, you know, uh, not uh, once a week or twice a week, uh, at least three times a week if not more. And, and the exercise should be you know, relatively low resistance, so, so not lifting heavy weights. Uh, it ought to be low impact, uh, meaning things like you know, swimming, water aerobics, uh, a, a stationary bike, uh, things that aren't putting a lot of stress on the joints, and uh, what we call endurance exercise. So uh, muscles, so um, exercising muscles uh, using things like, uh, like eccentric, uh, Eccentric training and um, uh, more repetitions, so low weight and increased repetitions. Wow, that is really funny. <laughs> funny what a, a, a you know, PC can do to a beautiful image made on that. Um, <laughs> so. What this is demonstrating, as you can clearly see, is, uh, is what the muscles uh, of your pharynx look like. Okay, and so so the swallowing problems in uh, IBM uh, really can be caused by actually two different uh, mechanisms. So one is in weakness in uh, what we call the uh, upper pharyngeal uh, muscles. And um, many, many speech therapists, so uh, SLP swallowing therapists, um, when they watch how you swallow, especially using a, a video fluoroscopic swallow study, they are uh, able to see, based on the way that you swallow, ways of compensating for uh, weakness of individual muscles. So uh, you may be told to, uh, to uh, you know, swallow with your you know, head uh, actually bent down as a common sort of uh, you know, compensatory mechanism or, or turn to the right, turn to the left. So, so there's a number of, of uh, uh, a very simple strategies that can be done for uh, compensating for weakness of the uh, uh, pharyngeal muscles. Um, now, uh, Everyone with any degree of swallowing problems in IBM really uh, uh, needs to know uh, what to do if they start choking. So learn, learn Heimlich maneuver, uh, make sure your caregiver, your loved ones uh, are comfortable uh, giving that as well. If the uh, swallowing problems get worse, 
there is a, uh, a relatively simple procedure uh, known as a uh, esophageal dilation, uh, which, which can be done when there is narrowing of the upper esophageal sphincter. So the way to uh, diagnose that is with a video fluoroscopic swallow study. So I uh, mentioned two ways of swallowing problems. Uh, one is weakness in, in the muscles that uh, initiate swallowing, and uh, uh, the other is narrowing of uh, uh, what's called the upper esophageal sphincter. So the uh, narrowing can be addressed uh, by either esophageal dilation, or if it's more severe, a uh, uh, actual surgical uh, procedure, what's called trichopharyngeal myotomy. Here's what it looks like for the uh, esophageal dilation. So a, uh, a gastroenterologist goes in there um, with a scope, uh, identifies the area of, the area of narrowing, uh, actually passes a, uh, a small balloon um, into that narrowing, uh, opens it up, and uh, in many cases it is uh, uh, essentially curative, at least for uh, you know months, uh, if not years. So uh, usually it's not a, a permanent uh, uh, you know, treatment, but it's uh, it's often extremely uh, beneficial. And then. In terms of the uh, actual surgical procedure, um, even though it sounds awful, cryptopharyngeal myotomy, it's actually a uh, relatively simple procedure uh, where they uh, where they go in and uh, open the um, upper esophageal sphincter. So that's a, a permanent uh, you know, fix for the narrowing of the upper esophageal sphincter. Okay, so. What about finger flexion movements? Um, a number of uh, our patients with IBM uh, love uh, love this device. So it's really simple, uh, ultimate hand helper, available online for $20. Um, and uh, what it is, is it, it, it really helps you um, uh, both exercise those uh, long finger flexor muscles and, and also keeps your joints and tendons uh, mobile. So you're, you're able to uh, actually adjust the level of resistance. Did you have a question? No, there's some. Oh, are you, are you demonstrating? Something like this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there are. Uh, same thing. I'm sorry? It's, it's so maybe the same thing. Or you, you can go in the store, in musical store, and just ah, okay. buy this. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, I, I, I've, I've uh, seen lots of, of different devices, uh, and the uh, actual type of a device probably doesn't matter that much, but the important thing is, is no matter how weak your, your finger flexors are, uh, you want to, uh, as much as you can on a regular basis, uh, exercise them to some degree. Now, if the um, if your your uh, grip uh, weakness uh, really gets to the point where uh, you're not able to uh, actually uh, um, use your uh, your first and second digit in order to, for example, you know, grab a pen or or a key, uh, there are uh, other uh, other procedures that can be done, uh, which I'll talk about. So anything from bracing to uh, a surgical procedure. So here's uh, an example of um, one of our patients who uh, had um, IBM and had uh, essentially no uh, uh, ability to grasp uh, with his index finger, so, so no finger function. Uh, however, he had a uh, uh, very strong extension of his wrist. And we have a uh, uh, hand surgeon at Johns Hopkins who is uh, 
really pioneering a uh, uh, procedure to uh, actually use the uh, extensor tendons to actually power your your finger flexion. So um, let me show you how this works. Uh, it turns out that the um, the actual tendons which uh, will will power extension of the wrist lie anatomically uh, right next to the individual tendons which are involved in uh, in finger uh, in finger flexion and uh, you might say well uh, well gee don't I need to be able to uh, extend my wrist uh, well, the answer is yes. However, uh, you have you have multiple muscles that will do that, and uh, if you think about it, you don't you don't really need to you know, you know do any sort of strong forceful movement with extension of the wrist. So what this procedure does is it, it basically uh, uses one of your wrist uh, extensor muscles, so a muscle that goes like this, and uses that to uh, actually power your your finger flexion, such that you can use the, uh, the very distal tip of your index finger uh, and, and, and grasp uh, you know, something like a um, you know, pen or, or keys or something like that. So uh, what I was going to show you is an example. Uh, I'm sorry. Just, just going back to your previous slide there on the uh, device that you had. Yes. Per your, uh, one, yeah, right there, per your advice, I got one of those. And uh -huh. Just as an endorse, but I, I find it easy to use. Um, it's like a lot of things, you know, you don't know that it helps directly, but I can say it's easy to use, and I still read pretty doggone well with my hands. If my legs were as good as my hands still, I'd be, I'd be you're real good. So I do like that device. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, we have done this now on uh, around 11 patients. Um, and what I'll say is that, you know, it's, uh, it's not a, a, a uh, you know, dramatic improvement for most. But uh, most patients notice some improvement. Uh, so, so uh, uh, for example, in this patient, um, he uh, noted uh, improved ability to uh, actually button his, his shirt and uh, was able to use, use that hand much more. Here, uh, here's an example of, uh, of what it looked like um, when he was trying to uh, pull the spoon, use a, a you know, you know, pegboard, or button his shirt uh, before the procedure. Uh, Here's what it looked like uh, actually four months post-operatively. So much more normal uh, mechanical movements of the, of the uh, hand. So the um, real limitation though is uh, once the surgery is done, you're, you're not able to uh, use that uh, hand for um, around six weeks. And, and that's really the uh, limiting sort of factor in, uh, in considering that. Procedure, so uh, you either have to be able to stand up uh, using only one arm, or have a you know, caregiver who uh, is able to help you. So, so, so the reason is, uh, you know, it uh, really takes six weeks for that uh, actual tendon to uh, repair itself. Okay, so um, last couple minutes, going to talk. Uh, about clinical trials that are uh, up and coming. Um, many of you have probably heard uh, about um, aramoclomol. So, so I mentioned the uh, way that it works is by preventing the formation of occlusions. Um, and uh, in France, there is a, uh, a small trial of a uh, autophagy uh, inducer called rapamycin. And, uh, and what that does is accelerates the process of, of getting rid of the inclusions. Um, I'm sure all of you are, are familiar with uh, uh, what uh, most people are considering a negative trial 
at this point uh, in terms of BYM 338 the Magra map. Um, but uh, what I would say is that even though Novartis had a, has you know, decided to uh, not you know, pursue uh, an, an FDA indication for inclusion body myositis, they are uh, actively you know, studying it in clinical trials for uh, other muscle diseases. And uh, based on, on what we know so far about it, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna. Um, so, so, so here's some uh, very early unpublished uh, data that uh, you might have heard Steve Greenberg uh, mentioned. So, so uh, clearly the um, high dose. Gosh darn this thing! I'm sorry. Um, clearly the high dose uh, BYM 338 has a significant improvement in uh, increasing uh, uh, muscle size. So that's really what it was uh, designed to do. And so even though this uh, you know, clinical trial didn't meet its primary endpoint, there was, uh, was clearly a dose-dependent significant improvement in uh, increasing muscle size, and it, it, it uh, really seems to be safe. So the um, only side effects were uh, uh, muscles, muscle spasms and GI. So um, really because of this, if, if we can develop uh, another therapy that uh, is actually addressed at, um, or it, uh, that's focused on uh, slowing down the uh, underlying cause of uh, IBM, I think there is reason to think we could use this in combination uh, with a, a drug that will actually prevent uh, muscle degeneration. Um, another uh, way to go about this is uh, injection of a gene therapy uh, approach uh, known as folistatin. So it's a myostatin inhibitor that functions uh, in much the same way as BYM 338 and um, that uh, actual clinical trial is, is ongoing. So the, uh, the advantage of, of this therapy is that it's local delivery, so it's, in, it's delivered just to the uh, muscles that are weak. Uh, um, it also it has very long-term uh, expression of the, this myostatin inhibitor. The, um, uh, the uh, you know, downside or, or concern is probably a better word is, uh, that uh, really the gene therapy is new, and, uh, and once you have this gene implanted uh, into the muscle, uh, we don't really have a way of, of getting rid of it, of turning it off. And so um, even though we don't have any reason to think that it would have you know, cardiac side effects, for example, uh, because of, of, of the unknown, uh, um, everyone is being very slow and and cautious, and um, uh, as far as I know, there are plans of, of continuing it beyond these initial uh, uh, you know, nine patients at the moment. Yes. Um, and then uh, finally, I'll, I'll just very briefly talk about uh, this um, you know, you know, new clinical trial, uh, Aramoclamol. Um, so, uh, Aramoclamol, uh, what it does is it uh, increases your, your cell's normal ability of getting rid of misfolded proteins or, or, uh, or refolding uh, misfolded proteins. And so, um, uh, actually, through a, a, a large team of, of doctors in the uh, uh, UK uh, as well as Kansas, They've shown that it, it has some efficacy in a mouse model of inherited IBM. So uh, remember what I was saying earlier about the caveats. We don't know how well the, uh, the BCP uh, mouse model will actually translate to uh, you know, sporadic IBM. But uh, importantly, it was also tried uh, in a uh, in phase one study 
in uh, his sporadic conclusion body myositis using um, sort of you know, typical uh, uh, you know, functional measures, uh, IBM FRS that measures things like swallowing, handwriting, um, walking, climbing stairs, etc. All the things listed here. And um, although it's uh, you know too early to uh, say it was this you know trial was really designed uh, for a, a safety study, but there uh, is a trend towards uh, improvement in, uh, in patients on the drug uh, relative to uh, actual placebo. So that is uh, was encouraging enough for the uh, uh, FDA to, to uh, approve um, what will uh, now be a phase two uh, clinical trial of uh, aramocophal. The um, nice thing about it is that it's a uh, an oral drug, a pill, uh, which is taken three times a day. The um, assessments will be at 1, 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20 months. So uh, essentially every every four months for uh, almost two years. And uh, right now they're planning uh, 150 patients at uh, multiple sites around the U.S. Um, so uh, actually just on September 1st, uh, uh, they um, updated the inclusion exclusion criteria on uh, on actually clinicaltrials.gov. So um, if uh, if you've been wondering, you know uh, what the inclusion exclusion criteria are, are for this trial, it is now available uh, on the website. Um, we're not really <coughs> sure uh, exactly when it will start. Um, it, it, uh, uh, we may be able to start, you know, screening as as early as this fall, uh, but we're still waiting. <coughs> Let's see if I have anything else. Okay, so that's it. This is my acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement slide. I want to uh, thank all my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, uh, especially Andy, Andy Mammon, Lisa Christmasstein, and Phil Wong. So uh, thank you, Sarah, for that uh, extremely long uh, presentation. I'm, I'm happy to take uh, additional questions. I don't. I don't. It's still, uh, you, know, you know, somewhat fluid. It, uh, there is likely to be a lot of overlap in the sites that were uh, also done for uh, Novartis' study. So, uh, with a few changes. Yes. Correct. We can't hear the questions, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can you have the microphone? He's yeah. got it over here. We have a microphone over here. Sorry. Uh, let me let me repeat the question. So the uh, question is whether uh, one would think aramacamol uh, would only help slow uh, you know, degeneration and not improve regeneration, and and uh, uh, what you said is correct. So uh, likely the uh, new study will be done along with a very you know, rigorous exercise and physical therapy program uh, such that you are you know, helping to, to rebuild uh, muscle while you're slowing degeneration. Uh, uh, back on dysphagia, yes. a surgical procedure, is that highly specialized or does it become so for uh, IBM patients? Yeah, so uh, precopharyngeal myotomy it's a, um, uh, it's definitely not a commonly performed procedure. So it's done by uh, ENT, uh, otolaryngology uh, professors. So um, you would definitely want to uh, you know, make sure that uh, whatever uh, ENT position you were you know, uh, referred to has uh, uh, experience with that uh, Procedure in, in IBM. Do you know anything about the Scholar Rock SRK015 um, drug that's under development? No, I do not. Sorry. What um, what is it uh, under development for? Uh, 
for IP. Okay. Yeah, maybe I know know what of a different uh, name or uh, do you know any more details about it, like the company or the Scholar Rock? Is the oh, oh, Scholar Rock's the um, is name of the about, company. Yes. There's an article. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now that you mention that, it uh, rings a bell. Uh, you, you know more about it? No. Okay. Okay. Any other? Uh, I have. I wanted to uh, follow up on the uh, dysphagia and yes. uh, just give you an observation. I just uh, was recently diagnosed with uh, dysphagia and went in for a modified variant swallow and it was determined that I had moderate to severe dysphagia. But the speech uh, therapist decided that she wanted to try, since it was due to um, muscle weakness um, at the, by the base of my tongue, she wanted to try uh, vital stim as a, uh, as a therapy. And after about, oh, about eight weeks, I guess it was, of, uh, and what that is, is it's, a, it's mild electrical stimulation at the uh, the base of your throat, right right in here, and um, after about eight weeks, I went back out a repeat of the barium, uh, the modified barium swallow, and uh, it improved to uh, mild to moderate uh, dysphagia. Great. Um, actually, actually, would you uh, you know, mind demonstrating your uh, Easton uh, devices? So uh, Augie is really a you know, pioneer. Uh, in, uh, in terms of research and development of, of physiotherapy and IBM. This, this is what I'm wearing, and, and if, for those of you in the back, you may not be able to see, what, what I am wearing is uh, it's electrical stimulation unit um, on my leg. And uh, what you can see there is the uh, lower unit around the, the calf of my leg. And uh, control yourselves. But. <laughs> this is the uh, the unit on the upper part of my leg to uh, to charge the, uh, the quadricep, and what this does, and I've got a foot switch sensor on my shoe, and what this does, um, it char it charges the muscle, um, the anterior tib on the uh, on my calf, on the outside of my my calf, the anterior tib that controls foot flexion. And then uh, the upper part has got uh, electrodes that, that go from uh, about four inches above the knee to the upper part of my quad, um, and it charges the quadricep. And this is called a functional electrical stimulation, and because this is used in time with gait, so it only works when I'm walking. And the way it works is that as I'm walking, as my heel hits the ground, it charges the upper part or the quadricep muscle and it, it, it charges it, forces that muscle to contract so that as I'm walking and I need that muscle to propel me forward, it, it helps engage that muscle and help it contract more. So it helps me while I'm walking. It also trains muscle memory and it's keeping the healthy, you know, we have, all have these vacuoles in our, in our quadriceps, but we also still have healthy muscle. So. This is help, helping to keep that healthy muscle vibrant and, uh, and, and strong. So then as my heel raises up off, off the ground, then the controller sends a signal to stop the uh, upper part and engage the lower part so the anterior tip is charged. So now that as my foot is coming forward, my foot drop doesn't cause me uh, to trip and uh, like on carpet or on uh, uneven pavement. It actually forces contraction of the muscle, which pulls my foot up as I walk. And the interesting thing that, that we found about this early on is that um, there was a, a carryover effect. So after about two weeks of, of doing this, this kind of uh, therapy, um, I would go home and then for the rest of that day and into the uh, next day, um, it was like I you know, was still walking with, with the unit on. So there was a somewhat of a carryover effect to it. Now, am I gonna build muscle with this? No, no. But I think what it's doing, it's helping me to uh, stay functional, stay mobile longer than uh, if I wasn't doing it. 
Yeah, and I, I would uh, also uh, imagine that it, it's uh, really, really improving your, you know, your muscle tone uh, such that it's uh, really enhancing your uh, ability to uh, exercise your muscles when you walk. Well, it does. It, it, it bothered me. I have increased when I was doing my active therapy with this with a uh, neurological physical therapist. Um, I have I increased the distance that I was walking by about eighty percent, and then she had me walking um, up and down wheelchair ramps, um, three hundred foot ramp up and then three hundred foot back down, and um, I got to the point where I was uh, walking just under a mile, but half of it was going uphill, which I never could have done before. So it has definitely helped me to uh, to increase my walking ability. That's great. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you want to tell us how expensive? Yeah, I know how much, and you don't really want to know. I mean, yeah. uh, you uh, could drive a small car for what these uh, costs. Okay. However, however, with that said, um, I just gave a session on this, and I told the folks, I said, if this is something that you think might might be helpful to you, when you get back home, talk to your doctor, um, your uh, your neurologist, or talk to your physical therapist if you're seeing one. But you need to be talking to a neurological physical therapist. Um, about uh, seeing if the clinic that they're in uh, might be interested in getting one of these because these things are actually they're much more prevalent than uh, than I would have even guessed. These things this is made by Bioness, B I O N E S S, and uh, clinics all over the place use these things, but mainly for neurological uh, rehab with Parkinson's patients or stroke patients. Um, Why do you use this? Is pretty much the first time we've tried to use it with a muscle disease. Yeah. Wolfie, how often were you using Bio, it? Bioness, B-I-O-N-E-S-S, and the unit that I have is a Bioness 300 plus. Uh, so, it's designed to be worn uh, because it's designed for people with neurological problems. Um, it's designed to be worn on a daily basis, but you have to build up with it. You don't get it out of the box and, and wear it every day because you can. You can fatigue your muscles, and especially with IBM, um, I found out that I can fatigue my muscles um, pretty quickly. So I use it about um, about four days a week. I haven't yet. Yeah, I haven't built up to that part. I've only had a. Uh, I've only had my own system for about a month, and uh, but I'm, I'm, theoretically you can build up to all day, but you have to take it off for about 15 minutes during the day because the electrodes are, are pads and you have to moisten them when you put them on. It's not going to keep them on there all day. You need to keep let your skin breathe. Augie, what they told me, and I too have them, as Augie knows, what they told me was four hours max at a time, then right. an hour or so rest. Four hours max at a time, an hour rest, and then four hours again. And that's, that's no, what you want to get up all day. <clears throat> but uh, you know, I think I don't know that I'll ever get to that point. Uh, if I can just, if I can do uh, four hours, uh, four days a week, I, I think I'm going to make great gains. Because over the past, I've been doing this now for a year and a half, and uh, with a, under the supervision of a neurological physical therapist, and uh, we have seen some great progress. But I was only seeing her once a week. So now that I've got my own system, um, stand back. <laughs> I'll be dancing next conference. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, do you have another question here? Uh, not so much, and, and, and Tom might be able to address that. I, I think it's different mechanics. Uh, you know, walking is one thing, but but the, the mechanical movement of, you know, stepping up steps, um, I, I, can, I can go up. Um, uh, you know, about a half a dozen steps, I can still do that, um, and probably a little bit better than I, I could uh, two years ago. But, but I can't say that it's helped me significantly with going upstairs. Uh, yes. One last question. Yeah. The. Uh, uh, Actual primary outcome measure is uh, what they call uh, IBM FRS, um, uh, which I've listed there. So, so here's what it's measuring. 
So it's a functional rating scale for IBM, so it measures uh, swallowing, handwriting, uh, use of utensils, uh, ability to dress, uh, hygiene, turning, sit to stand, walking, and climbing stairs. So it's it's meant to be a measure of a you know, wide variety of uh, important functional domains, important in IBM. Will these slides be on the website? I'm not sure. We have a, a yeah, viewer we'll, for there in the back. We'll make sure they're there. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.